Lord, may we serve you all our days, ever rejoice to sing your praise, as we together your wisdom seek, charge us with truth whenever we speak. Lord, may we ever know your will, come to us when our hearts are still, as we your guidance with joy receive, may we as one your bliss achieve. As we your guidance with joy receive, may we as one your bliss achieve. Tara's brave hill so quiet The day I came there Not a green leaf stirred on the air Not a bird did proclaim Ancient grandeur and fame Only ruins faint memories declare I marvel to think How can greatness e'er die? How can song disperse in the sky? How can hopes and dreams fade? How the warrior's sharp blade become dust was victory a lie. I stood there and pondered the great deeds of men's past, how like clouds in the sunset no glory can last. Even we, as we labor to achieve some bright end, must accept after glory that the night will descend. I've dreamed a broad rainbow over thicket and thorn. Over crags that call Terry, your hopes are forlorn. All too oft in my dreaming, courage turned to despair. Till I learned that success is but the courage to dare. As I gazed and thought sadly, of Tara's demise. Suddenly, I saw her walls rise, saw her long regal halls, heard her people's brave calls, as though time had doffed a disguise. And I knew in that moment the deeds that men do never die, each victory is true. Every effort we spend gives more strength in the end, till our gladness in life's ever new. Every effort we spend gives more strength in the end Till our gladness in life's ever new Thank you for that beautiful music especially the last song, which I asked them to sing. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a perfect song for our class today. Our class is on transcending your karma. And first, let me introduce myself. My name is Anandi or Naya Swami Anandi. For those of you who don't know me, I serve here at Ananda Village. Well, our subject today, transcending karma, my fellow panel speakers 
we'll speak on that topic, but I thought it would be valuable to begin with discussing what do we know about karma from our teachings? Because the word karma is lightly used in many, many ways, many of them not really very useful. So I wanted to start um, by explaining that. And we have to start with the idea that basically uh, karma is very, very big. Yesterday, Jyotish talked about God beyond creation, the still, unmoving presence of God, nothing else around, just pure God. And as he said, he took a portion of his consciousness and he vibrated it to become the Om vibration. And that Om vibration, which we also call the Divine Mother or the Holy Ghost, that Om vibration became creation. So God became creation. He didn't make it. He became it through the Om vibration. But that Om vibration is action. It's movement, isn't it? And that is primordial karma. So karma is everything. But it's also, it's such a beautiful, beautiful expression of God's love. I was reflecting this morning, we look at human beings and trees and intelligent forces around, and we know that the presence of God is what allows us to hear each other and see each other. The presence of God digests our breakfast, makes the trees grow, and so forth. That's the physical plane. On the astral level, it's even more miraculous and more beautiful because karma lives on the level of energy. And in making this creation, God said, how can I ensure that each being that I've created will move in the direction of self-realization? I can't be there pulling the strings and saying, you go there, talk to him, do that. But what I can do is I can place my intelligence within them in the form of karma, and through karma, they will learn the lessons that they need to learn that will make them choose to move eventually, eventually, eventually toward self-realization. Master said that when we give classes like this, we're all angels, aren't we? We hear the good attitudes. Jotish and Davy gave us the tips on the tools for a living, and we're like going, yes, definitely, that's me, strength, loving everyone. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm there. But then, you know, life happens and someone steps on our toe or cuts us off on the freeway and we forget the lesson because it's just in our head. But karma is a way of learning by experience. As Swami explains it, we put out a certain type of energy. In, we act, how many times do you act during the day? Every single thing you do is action. Some of those actions are neutral some of them are negative, some of them are positive. But with each action we put out, we, put out a, we initiate a little circle of energy. And it has a certain vibration to it based on our intention, based on the energy we put into it. Maybe it was a little bit kind, maybe it was extraordinarily kind, maybe it was a little bit hateful, very, very hateful. Whatever it is that we did will be completed. We have to complete that circle energetically. And so that completion of that circle is in energy form, karma, waiting within our energy spine for the right moment for that to happen to us so we can experience it. So we put out a little bit of greedy energy and lo and behold, maybe 10 lifetimes later when we've totally don't remember this at all, something happens and someone steals our money because they're greedy and we think, what a terrible thing. I would never want to hurt anyone like that. And our soul learns the lesson. There's a fun story that I heard about a mother who had two children. One was a, a small boy, and then he had a little sister who was just a toddler. And she was in the living room, and she heard from the bedroom this yell come out of her son. She goes running into the bedroom. And her son is just about to whack his little sister. He's just, she's just a toddler. And she said, what? Don't do that. And he said, well, she pulled my hair. 
And he, she said, well, don't, don't hurt her. She doesn't know what it feels like, how, how bad it feels to have her, your hair pulled. Just leave her alone. She goes back into the living room, and then she hears a scream from the little girl. And she comes in, and the boy looks at her with a smile. He says, now she knows. <laughs> so that's karma. That's how it works. <laughs> we learn by doing, and then it, it comes back to us, and we, we find out. But when we look at life, and I think everybody instinctively has this feeling. You know, there's books written about why do bad things happen to good people. Everyone feels that if you do good, you should receive good, and that's the basic principle of karma. But we don't see the big picture. Master told a beautiful story in his um, early lessons. It's called The Story of Mr. Sham and Mr. Honest. And Mr. Sham and Mr. Honest uh, shared a duplex, mm -hmm. and they um, were, were actually total opposites. Mr. Sham, just as his name said, just did everything bad. You know, he was, a, uh, he was uh, evil, he, he drank too much, he indulged too much in everything, he cheated his customers, he was unfair, he took advantage of helpless people, Everything evil that you could do, he did it. And meanwhile, he thrived. He seemed to, no matter how evil he was, he seemed to attract to him people who wanted to invest with him, help his company grow. He was getting richer and richer and happier and happier. And meanwhile, Mr. Honest was a person who loved God and he meditated. He loved to meditate and study the scriptures and be very, very dharmic in his dealings with people. And he was sick all the time, and he couldn't make any money. Everything he tried failed, and it was just a terrible situation. And, of course, every now and then, Mr. Sham would just get on his case and tease him and be horrible to him and so forth. And so finally, one day, it came to a head. They met outside the duplex, and Mr. Sham said to him, you know, your problem is your, your mind is all twisted with this strange spiritual stuff, and, and you should live a natural life. Look at me. When I want to have a drink, I drink. When I, when I want to indulge, I indulge. I just follow my natural instincts, and look how well it works for me. If you would like to give up all this God stuff and follow me, I'll give you money, and we'll get you started on the road to success. And Mr. Honest was just outraged. He said, never. I will never follow your evil ways. I don't believe in them at all. In fact, I believe God is not on your side, and I'm going to prove it to you. 30 days from now, on a Friday, 30 days from now, I'm going to show you uh, that your ways don't work and mine do, because I am going to pray intensely over these next 30 days that God reveal to us what is the right way and what is the wrong way. And that Friday will give us the information we need, and you will see that you will fail, and I will succeed. Well, Mr. Sham just loved that. He said, great, this is great. I can't wait. So time went by, and Mr. Honest was just praying and praying. Now, Mr. Honest was, he was a good person. He didn't have it all totally together. Here, here was his prayer. Oh, my beloved God, if you really exist... Please, please bring misfortune to Mr. Sham on Friday and bring me fortune so I can win the bet and prove that you exist. Well, it wasn't the best prayer. But, but he was sincere and he was a good person and he really applied himself. And so he was praying and praying. It was the best way to relate to God he knew. It was just all he could do. So he was doing his best. He was praying. And finally, that Friday came and he was walking to work, and he was engrossed in, in talking to God and praying to God, and he got hit by a car. He almost got killed by the car. They took him to the hospital. He had to have surgery and so forth. Okay, so that's Mr. Honest. Mr. Sham, meanwhile, wakes up with this great joy in life. He feels like today is his lucky day. So just to celebrate, he decides to go out to the forest and kill a bunch of birds and kind of <laughs> just revel in death and... And so he does that, and he, he goes out and shoots a lot and just loves it. And then he brings his bag of birds back, and he's sitting against a tree, and he's sort of aimlessly got his knife kind of 
hitting the ground like this, and he hears a chink. And he goes, oh, and he starts digging and digging and digging, and he unearths a treasure box that several decades ago some pirates had left there. It had $3 million in gold coins. And he goes, wow, this is great. And he dumps out the birds and pours the gold coins into the bag and, and goes home. And then he hears about what happened to Mr. Honest, and he's just delighted. He thinks that's the funniest thing in the world. Well, Mr. Honest finally gets through surgery, comes out, and of course he wants to hear what happened to Mr. Sham, and when he hears it, he said, that's it. I can't believe in God anymore, but I certainly can't follow the evil ways of Mr. Sham. I have to end my life. So he starts walking out into the forest with a plan of drowning himself in the lake. But because he is a good man, he gets stopped by a saint with a message from God. And the saint lets him know that he knows the whole story. And he says, you know, God doesn't respond to bets. You, that's not the way to uh, approach him. And you can't expect that just because you ask him to do something that he's going to do it in the way you want. And he said, besides, you need to know that in his previous lifetime, Mr. Sham actually was a very good man. He was generous. He was kind. He was noble. But near the end of his life, he started to think, this life's been kind of boring. I wonder, I wonder if I couldn't liven things up a little bit, and I'm going to try. I, I'm not sure I believe in God. I think I'll be an atheist, and I'm going to try the other approach to life. And so he died with that in his mind, and in this life he incarnated as an atheist and just wanted to do evil. But you see, he had acquired quite a lot of good karma, and that good karma he has been been paying out over this time. On the other hand, you in your last life were actually quite evil. You were selfish, you were greedy, you were an atheist. But near the end of your life, you began to repent and you thought, you know, this hasn't brought me any happiness. I want to seek God. I want to, that's, that's what I want to focus on. And so in the same way, you died with the desire to find God and that's how you came in. But you see, you've had a lot of bad karma to pay off in this life. Interestingly enough, on Friday, the balance of each of your karma was complete. All of Mr. Sham's good karma ended on Friday. All of your good karma, all of your bad karma ended on Friday, and now everything will be different. And lo and behold, Mr. Sham became extremely ill. While he was very ill, thieves came and stole all his money. He now was bedridden. Mr. Honest uh, Im immediately became well uh, for no reason at all, and his aunt decided to leave him $10 million and got him a start and so forth. And so the only way Mr. Sham was able to survive was through the uh, generous kindness of Mr. Honest. And so the story is very simplistic, but it's very beautifully done because it reminds us that when you look at your life, it's all there. Your karma is there. Everything in your life is something you've earned. But we are just looking at a little slice of it. And so we don't understand it. But Master said again and again, and to disciples, he said, if you're a disciple on this path, you must know every single thing that comes to you in life comes from the guru when you are ready to receive it. So this is a principle behind karma, but there's much more to understand in the sense that karma is very, very big. We've been around a long time. Lots of actions have been put out there. And in each life, we have what we call prarabdha, prarabdha karma, which is like a slice of the pie of your karma. You can't take it all in. If I have the karma to have six children, it's not going to happen in this lifetime. I'm not going to probably meet the Queen of England if that's part of my karma. But I have this that I, I can do, that this is what I uh, have for this life. And so when you're with somebody, you know, their life may look like really glorious and sailing and everything's perfect, and yours may look really bad. But what you don't see is you don't see the rest of the karma. Um, Swami described it as subterranean caverns, that within us 
we carry all the rest of that karma that's still to be revealed. And so some people who look like they're just practically free may have many, many things to do. I mean, for, I have to say, for people who are seeking God, we're getting close to the end. So I don't want to make this too bleak of a picture for us. We are getting close to the end. But, um, but those exist. And so, like, for example, when my, this was one of my favorite, uh, actually, parts of the path, uh, Swami's autobiography, The Path. He writes about his life at Mount Washington with Yogananda. And one of the disciples there was a man named um, Horace Gray. And Horace had, Swami called it spastic, maybe it was cerebral palsy. He, he couldn't move. He could barely speak. He could barely think. His, his, he was very, how would he communicate? It was extremely simple. And he, I think all the disciples there must have felt terribly bad for him because of his state. And yet, what did Master say? Master said, Horace is very nearly there. God realization. Horace is very nearly at God realization. And when one of the disciples said, well, it must be very simple. Uh, oh, he said, God is very nearly there. God is pleased with his devotion. And when one of the disciples said, well, it must be a very simple kind of devotion, the Master said, oh, that's the kind God loves the best. So we don't know. We don't know who we are. We don't know who our friends are. We don't know who the person who annoys us so much. <laughs> they could be, that could be their last life, just what they have to release and learn. So that karma Swamiji said that actually when we come into this life, yes, we have lots of karma, but only really one or two major lessons to learn. That's not very much, considering how many things you've done in your life and different stories and different scenarios. One or two main things to learn in this lifetime. Now, what would those be? I mean, I can't say, and I think sometimes those things would even be things we can't even cognize intellectually, but sometimes those things just happen to be the things that are the absolutely hardest part of your life. Wouldn't that make sense? I mean, if you came for just one or two lessons, they're not going to be something that you go, oh, figured that out. No, it's going to take a while. And so if there's in your life something that you're saying like, oh, if I could only get through this illness, then I'd be able to really make spiritual progress. Well... Maybe the illness is part of your spiritual progress. Maybe the financial challenge is, is kind of what you incarnated to do. So we don't know these things. A woman um, came here on retreat, and uh, we had a talk, and she was sharing that she was filled with regret because she had always wanted to have children, and uh, now she was getting too old to have children. Someone had proposed to her years ago. She refused him because she didn't think he was the right person, and now she really regretted that she didn't take that step. Well, we, I, we went through that, and we talked about that, and the next day I said to her, you know, that there's this teaching that maybe you only have one or two things to learn in this lifetime. What do you think might, you might have come to learn? And very tentatively she said, regret? I said, yeah. What if you'd married that man? And then you, you realize you actually didn't love him and you spent all your life wishing you'd never married him or you married him and you had children and then you couldn't stay with him because you didn't really love him and now you had a single parent. And regret can go on and on and on if that's your habit. So let's talk now not about what to do about that situation, but what to do about regret. What's at the core of what we're trying to do. This is a little bit what Davy was talking about, about introspection yesterday. What's underneath? What's underneath? Here's the surface, but what, what are we looking at underneath? That's what we want to try and get at. You know, karma has so many layers, and I, I know I've shared this with some of you, but one of the things that Master said that made me so upset, actually, until I really got it, he said, you know, it's not enough just to live through your karma. If a person loses a leg 
in one lifetime. That's some kind of karma that they're paying off from the past. But if they identify themselves as a person who has only one leg, then guess what? In their next life, they may reincarnate with only one leg, or they may reincarnate and lose their leg very soon after. Why? Not because God is punishing them, but because they're holding the thought form in their own consciousness. When I got over being annoyed (laughs) with this teaching, I realized how profound it is that we have to be really free. Not just kind of, okay, I check that off. Oh, I did that. I got through that. This person was mean to me. That was some bad karma. I got sick. That was... No, we have to be free in our consciousness. We had a woman here who, wonderful, wonderful part of our community, uh, uh, not an actual member, but deeply involved with Ananda. And she had stage four cancer. And she had to go through chemotherapy, and she came through it beautifully. She's well. Uh, Not only did she survive the cancer, but just the whole process went very well. And someone said to her, how did you get through it so well? And she said, and this is a very beautiful part about karma, and I hope it's not getting too much into the idea of transcending karma, but it's essential to understand. She said, well, I didn't reject the fact that I had cancer. I didn't accept the fact that I had cancer. I just tried to keep my consciousness high. You see? So it's really not about what's going on in your life. It's about, can I stay connected to God and know that that's my reality? That this calmness and joy and bliss, we saw this in Swami Kriyananda all the time, whatever happened, it was the same. The calmness, the bliss, the outer facts As Davy said yesterday, we have to, yes, we have to accept them. The woman obviously noticed that she had cancer. She didn't like, oh, I'm in denial, I'm in denial. No, she accepted it, but she moved on. That's not who I am. And she identified with that higher level. So the question is always asked about karma. What about free will? How much free will do we have if it's all karma? And I have very interesting statements from three saints. And and you might get confused by this. The first thing Swami Kriyananda said, and again, we were a little bit gasping when he said it, is he said, every single thing you do in life, including the color shirt you wore today, is decided by your karma. Gasp. Okay, that was what he said. Ananda Moy Ma was asked about karma and free will, and she said, karma, your life is like a train. The karma is happening. The question is, will you be at the front of the train or the back of the train? When you're at the front of the train, you're with the conductor, right? You're like going, okay, I'm choosing this. I'm going with it. I'm, I'm accepting this. I'm flowing with this. I'm with God. It's all good. When you're at the back of the train, you're just getting dragged along, kicking and screaming. Um, and then Master said that 75% of our life is predetermined, and 25% we have a little bit of wiggle room, depending on what we do. Now, you might go, oh my God, what do we do with that? But you know, I don't think... It matters at all which of those we want to stick with. I think they probably all come together if you have enough wisdom. Because the fact is, no matter what our karma is, we don't know that. We have no idea where this train is going. It's so bizarre to think about. You know, you could, you just have no idea when you'll die, when your friends will die, what's going on, you just don't know. But Every day, you have the opportunity to make a choice. Every moment, you have an opportunity to make a choice. Will, as Jochish said yesterday, energy going up. Will I choose an upward direction for my energy or a downward? Will I get discouraged or will I be 
uh, charged up with, okay, I can do this. I can accept it in a positive way. And that is what's the most important thing for us, not what our karma is, but what choices do we make? Are those choices predetermined by our karma? Yes, they are, but we don't know that. And so we just have to reach up as high as we can in every moment. And that is what our life is about. And the reason I asked our friends to sing Tara, the hill that was Tara, was so beautiful, is that song, uh, Tara is a hill in Ireland where the great kings lived. And now it's just grass. So you had all this royalty and high, these were very high consciousness people living there doing great things. And now it's a grassy hill that the singer was visiting. But as he stood there, as he said, it came back to life and he realized, and this is what I wanted to, to, I want to make sure I got it right. And I knew when he saw everything come back, he said, and I knew in that moment, the deeds that men do never die. Each victory is true. Every effort we spend brings more strength in the end till our gladness in life's ever new. By the choices we make, we build our strength until that strength is so great. Our gladness in life, what's that? Ever new joy. Until we realize that we have always been in God, filled with God, united with God's joy. So he's sent us the great, great blessing of karma in all its many guises, not for punishment, but to help us awake from limitation. <laughs>